Hi everybody, um, welcome to our special presentation, Record Like a Pro. Uh, my name is Nikki Abissi, I am the trauma mentor of the Montclair Orchestra. The Montclair Orchestra is a training orchestra. We use a side-by-side -side model where all of the mentors are principals in their section and they come from the New York Philharmonic, the Metropolitan Opera, the New Jersey Symphony, uh, St. Luke's, the American Symphony Orchestra, and then the rest of the orchestra is filled out by top music students uh, around New Jersey, Montclair, New Jersey, um, from Juilliard and Montclair State and Manus and Manhattan School of Music um, and Rutgers. And if you are a student right now and you're interested in learning more about our program, please check out our website, montclairorchestra.org. Uh, and there's a contact tag and you can email us and uh, we'd love to hear from you. So this presentation is going to be about everything that we all need to know about recording at home. And I, we're going to have Jim Nova do the second half. He is the second trombonist of the Pittsburgh Symphony and uh, what I like to call an overdubbing genius, although more apt, somebody corrected me, it's overdubbing Jedi. Uh, if you have not checked out his website, you are missing out. Um, amazing trombonist and amazing musician. Uh, but first we're going to hear from Lawrence Rock, Larry Rock, the audio director of the New York Philharmonic, and he's going to get into some of the nitty gritty technical things about how to properly record yourself. Take it away, Larry. Hi, everybody. Recording. Recording is fun, you know. It's... Um, capturing music and then you get it into your mind's ear and it can be thrilling and it can be frustrating. Recording at home is a challenge because they're not concert halls. Um, one of the first things you encounter, of course, is that it's not as quiet as you thought. Now, you may or may not be able to do too much about it, but obviously it's best not to record in the kitchen. Um, but uh, I wanna talk uh, about the room acoustic situation. Also, uh, then we'll get into the nuts and bolts of it, literally the the, uh, the hardware that you would use. There's a whole range of stuff, but I, I have some ideas that I think uh, would be useful. Um, then we can get into some techniques about recording particular instruments. Uh, so let's just talk about the whole idea of uh, recording at home. Now the First question is, what's it for? Uh, is it an audition tape? You notice I said tape, everybody still says tape. Uh, but is it uh, something that has strict rules attached? When the Philharmonic uh, puts out a request for, uh, you know, they open auditions, and for the first round, you, know, you can submit recordings, it's all files now. It used to be cassettes, it was all CDs, you name it. Um, but uh, the, they would also put out, I haven't seen the very latest one, but one is they wanted it mono, not stereo. Part of the, the, the idea is it leveled the playing field because in stereo, it, you know, stereo enhances the sound, which is a nice thing. But if one person can get really great stereo and someone else is in mono, then you know they don't want to have that kind of artificial advantage. So anyway, it so happens that their rule is is mono. They make some uh, uh, suggestions about you know placement and all that. Unfortunately, it, it is going to vary a lot depending upon the room you're in. Now, uh, it, it so happens this room that, that I'm in, we have a piano. It's supposed to be a dining room, but um, it's a room with a piano. Uh, and on the other side here is the living room. So it's kind of a, you know, two rooms in one and all that. Well, it's a nice combination of live, but large enough that it doesn't get like boxy, you know, and, and, and boomy. Ideally, you'd have a room that has some ambience, but it doesn't, you're not aware, as I say, you don't hear the walls, because that's a problem. In some live rooms, if they're small, you're gonna hear this very finite distance that, that the instrument is from the walls. 
in that case, you'd probably be better off in a slightly drier, you know, deader room, especially if it's quiet. Uh, it's tricky with auditions because, in theory, you shouldn't be tweaking them after the fact. It should just be a representation of, of your playing. Now, uh, it, it's so easy to do things now in terms of, you know, equalization and reverb and, you know, some kind of um, enhancement. Um, but just keep in mind that what you might accomplish in a, uh, an audition recording, it may not serve you well if you've dressed it up so that it's not you anymore. So I think honesty is the best policy, ultimately. That said, it should be clean, clean quiet, and, and properly recorded so uh, it's not, you know, like scraping sound because it's too close or is just like so distant, uh, you know, there is a, a, a sweet spot, we'll say. Th there's a kind of a, a golden ratio, I guess, of how far to put a microphone uh, from an instrument in a certain space, a size space. Uh, and because of the, the tendency to pick up room, unwanted room acoustics, um, you know, you think, well, if a room isn't that that resonant, that maybe you want to get farther away so that you pick up some of that resonance. Well, if there there's no resonance to really get, then you're just going to get this kind of roomy sound. So uh, generally speaking, about six feet away is a good distance for uh, setting up mics. But we'll get more uh, into that uh, in kind of the second part. Uh, I just want to go into equipment a little more. And uh, first of all, microphones. Now, uh, there are, are various mics that you can get of, of different levels of quality and so on. There are a lot of good ones available now, uh, like the one I'm actually talking to you on now, which is a USB mic. So it plugs right into your computer. And uh, it was actually uh, uh, recommended by one of our string players who, uh, uh, well, had been recording. <laughs> one of the worst things that happened in 2020 were uh, 120 iPhone recordings and trying to, to mix it down and, and make sense of it all. Um, and part of the problem is that, that iPhones, each one is a little different and the microphone's just not that good. One of the nice things about this one, and it's an Apogee, and I'll, I'll show you some slides of, of the actual names. Um, it, they give you three cables and you can go into a computer, either the traditional USB or USB-C, or it's got a lightning bolt. And like magic, you plug it in and it just works when you record either audio or video. Uh, and, and it's a nice sounding mic. Anyway, it's an Apogee Mic Plus. So <clears throat> you'll hear me speaking on that. Um, now there are some fancier ones. Um, there, uh, if you're going to get into recording where, uh, first of all, like in stereo and where you, you really need to control things, you're going to want something like this, which is a typical interface. Uh, mics go in, uh, USB cable into the computer. Um, this particular one is discontinued, but Tascam makes you know, many others. Um, the uh, thing to keep in mind is you may need to download drivers from Tascam or whoever site. Some of these things are so-called plug and play, but uh, a lot of times they work better when you get the proper drivers. Um, so uh, then uh, there's still the old, what, you know, generically we call the Zoom recorder, which is a flash recorder, which is a self-contained thing. Uh, I think since we always end up putting the stuff on computer anyway, that you may as well record to it. Uh, the thing about the interface is you can use whatever kind of mic. Now there are some Zoom recorders that that have uh, inputs for external mics, but I I just think that we've kind of moved beyond that <laughs> that stage um, and just go with the, uh, an interface where you can use any kind of mics. Um, the 
uber level, you might say. I mean, it's a mic that I use in my work. You see everywhere. And it's by a famous manufacturer, Neumann. Uh, the Georg Neumann invented the, the uh, um, condenser mic back you know, during World War II. So, uh, you know, it's a storied name. This particular model is the KM184. And of all the condenser mics, it is the best uh, value that you could ever hope for because uh, it's about $800 now. It's gone up a bit. But the other brands that, that I've used, like Sheps, uh, which is another German brand, um, or Danish Pro Audio make wonderful mics, but they're all at least twice as expensive. And they're great mics, but are they twice as good as this? I don't know. So this is a excellent uh, value. And it works on anything, you know. Uh, WQXR uses it as a, an announce mic. Um, I, when strings, you know, there might be a mic that's better for one particular thing or another, but you can't really go wrong with it. Uh, now, one, one area, Jim will talk more about like post-production and that sort of thing. Uh, because when you're recording on a computer, you need to be working with some kind of software. That is a very involved thing. And, and Jim can talk, he uses Logic, which is, is very good. There are a lot of other ones. The ones I use are kind of expensive and wouldn't, would be overkill. GarageBand uh, will work. Audacity is another one that's free. Um, but the, the, the word that I always use on that is, uh, about software is tutorials. Whatever you want to use, if you want to figure it out, there are a zillion tutorials. Um, so let's, uh, let's move into the um, uh, realm of how to mic these instruments. Uh, so happens in my house, I've got one of the main, one of each of the main four groups, um, strings, uh, uh, woodwinds, trumpets, and uh, well, keyboard, piano. Um, each instrument has its own quirks, but uh, let's just talk about piano and the kind of the easiest way to stay out of trouble, shall we say. Um, the, uh, let me just, there's a little message. Oop, it went away. Okay, good. Uh, there's a tendency, I think, to get close, too close to the hammers, and uh, you, you don't want to do that. You really want to get the, the resonance, and uh, I think you can probably see, I'm going to push this mic out of the way. And so this is that Neumann I'm talking about. And typically I come from towards the tail, not all the way at the tail. Some like the British like to do that. But about the middle of, of the uh, instrument. And of course, the lid could be open or it might be on low stick. So, you know, obviously you're going to have to adjust for that. But uh, the main thing is keeping it at a, at a distance such that you're not getting one section of the piano uh, dominant over all the others. So something like this, if you can um, get a, a sense of it without me trying to move my, uh, uh, I, need, I need someone with a, Robo cam to to cover this, but I'm I'm about uh, you know two thirds of the way from the the hammers to the end of the piano. Um, <clears throat> sometimes I have actually uh, put the mic up close to uh, the lid, and it it has an interesting effect because it it minimizes the reflections off the lid, and sometimes can just make a kind of cleaner sound. Uh, <clears throat> depends upon the room and the piano. Uh, one other little doodad before I go any further. <laughs> this uh, mic is mounted in uh, a little um, uh, mic stand adapter, and it's made by Shure, and it's another one of those things that's, that has always been around, and everywhere you go they have them. It's called, uh, uh, well, we all call them donuts because that's what they look like. Um, it's technically the A53M but it's a little mic mount and it holds a number of different kinds of mics and it gives you some shock isolation, which is a good thing because uh, um, 
you know, especially like at home, if there's some, you know, somebody's walking or thumping, it's one thing to have the noise of it in the distance, but to have the actual vibration go through the stand into the mic is not good. Uh, okay, so piano. Stringed instrument. I don't have a violin, but my daughter plays cello. She's starting in that. Uh, cello is a tricky one. Uh, there's a such a wide range of variability in the, in the sound of different cellos. Some are big and rich, and some are, have a more pointed sound. And and you know the players also, but the instruments themselves. And uh, the big problem usually with cello is getting clarity uh, and, uh, well, picking it out. Obviously, you're not going to have to worry about it in a concerto situation, but um, you want the warmth, but you want the clarity. I tend to start, if I'm just using one microphone, to, to start on the, and I'm going to just adjust here for cello, um, kind of like... Uh, this, if you can see, um, there, I'll move the stand like this. Uh, not right at the F hole, but a little bit, a little underneath it. And, and again, this is miniaturized. I mean, I would be farther away, but I want to get, want you to get the idea of the angle. Um, and, uh, uh, but, uh, this is on the high side. I would actually usually start over here on the low side, the low string side, because um, that's where it often is, is muddy. Uh, now, that said, if I use two microphones, which c can be good if you're if you're if you have two mics and you really want to, you know, get a, a comprehensive pickup of it. Then I would put the, the low mic on the high string side, and then I would put another mic up about here, about at the top of the body of the cello uh, on the high side. So you're kind of getting the cello in a crossfire, as it were. Um, I say cello, cello is, uh, is, is not easy, but... Uh, as long as you're not, um, you know, trying to come just directly in. Uh, a uh, tone meister, as they used to call them, uh, once said, uh, never point a microphone at a musician. I didn't know what he was talking about, but he, he had a, a, a good point because um, more often than not, you, you don't want to be right like down the barrel of something. And here, I'll, I'll show you uh, trumpet, which happened to be my instrument, but I'm not going to play it. Um, you know, sir, there were questions about it. You know, unless it's like reinforcement somewhere outdoors and or they're going for big effects, uh, which which happens. The idea of like clipping a mic to the bell, you know, yeah, it'll accomplish it, but it's not going to, it's not, what you want if you're trying to do a classical uh, audition thing. You want it to, to sound glorious. Well, the last thing you want to do is to, uh, <clears throat> you know, play, I'll just use this mic, you know, right in into the mic. You know, it's one thing when you see uh, singers in studio, you know, recreations on TV or whatever, you know, singing right into a mic, and even that's questionable. But you, you don't want to do that. and uh anything that just gets you a little bit off axis the mic can still be aiming at the instrument but just not down the barrel of the gun as it were um, and it's it's what i did with the cello uh somewhat with the piano it's the idea of just taking a slight side look at things and that it, it actually gives it a rounder, more balanced sound. Um, all right, let me, because uh, I know the time is clicking. Clarinet. Larry. Yeah. we have got a couple questions. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, could you clarify for the string instruments, if you're only using one mic, should it be toward the treble side of the F holes? 
uh, strings in general or cello in particular? Um, I This is a viola player asking the question, viola. so I think strings in general. Yeah. Um, well, you know what? If, hold that question for a moment. I want to pull up the slide I have of Great. Uh, where I have a kind of a general layout of miking every instrument. Uh, violin, viola, slightly different kind of animal. Um, and cello. Okay. And, and, and then turn your, your game up. A couple of options. That's why. Um, uh, and if you well, can talk a little louder, too, it'd be awesome. Uh, I'll get through. This is like the last of the other instruments. All right, clarinet. You know, ni either extreme is not what you want. You don't want to get, uh, you know, breath, reed, leak, whatever noise. And not a lot comes out of the bell, except if, like, everything is closed. Uh, so the name of the game is to be uh, pretty much at, at right angles of the instrument. So in other words, if uh, this is my sublime on my again, you would be farther away. But the idea of it it being, you know, this way, but also kind of off. An angle, and and either side is okay, but uh, something along those lines. So, yeah, I, I just would avoid the extremes. Um, and again, I, you know, this is sort of compressed. Let me um, share my screen, and I'll show you this kind of overall layout. Larry, we got another request to speak a little louder. Okay. Um, is everybody seeing that? Okay, so this is, uh, it's sort of laid out as if it was an orchestra, but, you know, it isn't necessarily, you can look at each one. Um, but to answer the question about viola, so, all right, here, violin slash viola. You know, one approach is to aim kind of at the F holes, you know, you, you kind of get a very rich sound, you know, uh, uh, that way. Um, but it doesn't always work. It can be sort of strident and it really varies. You know, I it so happens that this week, Joshua Bell is playing uh, with the Philharmonic for one of our, what is a video capture. For some reason or other, he always is picked up better by doing this approach, which is like, you know, from the end. In fact, if he's standing facing the audience, actually it's as if it's almost pointing, a, you know, right down from the, the end. In other words, if this was the violin, okay, cello, it would be almost like this. Hey aiming down the fingerboard. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a quirk of, of, of different instruments, different players, but, but those are the kind of the two options um, that, that I would use. Now, obviously there are literally infinite positions, um, but you know, depending on, uh, well, what works for you? If it's a, if it seems like a, uh, it's too too dark, and of course viola is going to tend to be darker. I think that this going from the front might actually um, do you a little better. Now, <clears throat> of course, none of this is showing. You know, are you standing? Are you sitting? Uh, you know, so how high off the floor? Uh, if you're at home, you know, you're, unless your ceilings are, are really high, then you may not gain a lot by standing because then, you know, if you have the mic higher than you are, then the mic's going to be kind of close to the ceiling. So, uh, you know, there's a certain amount of um, sussing it out depending upon the situation. Um, I hope I hope that 
uh, is helpful on the um, uh, violin viola front. Um, cello here, I, I sort of described, now I have both of them are on the same side here, but this is the idea of the lower one and the higher one. Uh, the double bass, of course, you can put a mic on a stand, and there you do tend to kind of aim at the, the uh, F hole. Um, just an option again, and for home, this may or may not work, but a PZM, you know, it's a, it, what they call a boundary layer mic. It sits on the floor, and uh, the, the thing about uh, picking up the bass is that it, it minimizes the room uh, interference, I'll say, because especially for uh, double bass, you know, it just, it really uh, excites the room, and it, it can be uh, a good solution uh, to the bass. Another, I have done, talking about uh, miking from, um, from behind, I did a recording once with a, a ba double bassist who was not a uh, professional exactly, so he, um, but a uh, big fan of the double bass, and, and it actually worked better. It, it removed a lot of, of um, production noise by, by miking the instrument from the back. But that's that's risky. Um, okay, on the subject of a couple options, bassoon. Now the thing with bassoon is if they're they're sitting with it at this angle like this, um, you, you don't want to be on this side where you know again because you, you don't want to just mic it down the the um, uh, you know the end. I know there's a fancy name for the. <laughs> <laughs> the end of a bassoon, but it's kind of similar to any woodwind instrument in that you want to be at kind of right angles to to the length of the instrument. Uh, and so I would always go to to the uh, musician's right. And again, probably about, you know, five feet in the air or something like that. And, and uh, yeah, I'm probably about five feet away. Uh, here, oboe clarinet, I, I show it either side. Again, it sort of off to the side a little bit. Flute, it's very important to stay away from the front of the instrument where, where they're blowing across the, the hole because you're gonna get so much of the, the kind of breathy, uh, bright sound that, um, because so much of, of the sound radiates, you know, out uh, along the, the whole length of the flute, and you get a much warmer sound when it, it, it seems odd, but it really works to mic it uh, from the side. Uh, there's a piano with two mics. We talked about piano. Um, let's talk about the bad boys of the French horn. Uh, horns are not only are they hard to play, <laughs> but they are hard to, to pick up because, uh, you know, all right, they blow to the rear. So one of the questions is what, what is the wall situation? If you're at home, are you playing into a wall? Are you going to play into a sofa? Uh, you know, and it, it just depends on what it works, if it, what works there. If the room is particularly live, uh, it, it may be better to play into a sofa uh, because uh, it, it may just bounce around uh, too much. Now, what, what I'm showing here Obviously, when people hear a horn, they're hearing it bouncing off of walls and, and, and giving you this kind of indirect sound. Um, but if you have uh, horns that are sitting in front of the brass of a major orchestra, if you have a, a mic pointing at the horn that way, you're just going to get the, the rest of the brass behind them. That's why, you know, I end up going from behind. But there's an important character here. It, as this picture shows, you know, you're sitting and the, the bell is kind of going almost sideways, but not really. It's about, about at the corner like this. The key is to, again, never aim it into the, the opening of the bell. And it's like skimming across the side of it. And this is also the case for the tuba, uh, where he's sitting and you know, the bell is up here and you just, you do not want to be aiming down into the bell. Uh, so this is a mic. The idea is to be pretty much like parallel to the floor 
and just just about at the same plane as as the bell but by no means aiming into it uh, and and I always tend to get, <coughs> excuse me come from the um, um, players left uh, now trombone and trumpet sort of same story stay off axis uh, now another thing with and you would probably be doing this at home as well is if you have a music stand uh, you don't want to aim, aim a mic into a music stand either um, which is why like trombones the way they're sitting it's usually better to come on their left and and come in this way um, trumpets this way um, you know some of it has to do with with whatever mechanical noise they're uh, masking and again working around a, a, a music stand and the way people tend to, to use it anyway this is a, a sort of a basic um, layout of, of how I mic instruments a lot of times this is in a, an ensemble and and it if you're doing a solo recording in stereo, it, it, that can be a whole other thing because there you would want to have, um, sorry, I'm looking off to the side at the big screen here, but um, this main pair, this would be like if it was an orchestra, but if you were doing a solo recording, but in stereo as a full presentation, mm -hmm. then it, it would be, uh, unless you can get two mics in just the right position to get everything you want, it's, it is often necessary to have a couple of mics that are getting the nice room, the church, as some people asked about, or a, a recital hall, and then have a spot mic that you sneak a little in that, that just gives you enough, uh, enough detail. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I, I hope that that uh, is probably just about the time um, uh, allotted for this discussion. I know there are going to be um, uh, more questions. Uh, you know, when you get beyond, um, you know, making a demo tape or a track, um, uh, you know, there's a whole world of, of production of trying to make records. Um, one point, though, that I did make mean to make earlier, and that is be careful of talk about bad boys. You know, we all love our iPhones, but they and you know the video that you can make on these things is really remarkable the audio not so much uh so really be careful uh using this to just make whatever kind of uh especially if this is an audition and that's where this this little mic comes in it makes a huge difference so if you dare to use this, uh, definitely get some kind of good mic to plug into it. These things are too easy to, <laughs> to use and abuse, at least from an audio standpoint. It's, it's frustrating because now I have to listen to things I'm working on off of my phone because that's the way people listen. But anyway, that's 2021. Okay, thank you. And um, we will certainly uh, address questions at some point. So, Larry, one, I'm, I'm going to ask two questions. One that I know a lot of people are interested in is, you know, you gave um, an exam, two examples of microphones, but what would you tell a student to buy? So what's like a budget option for yeah, a microphone um, and not a, you know. A... I, I should, um, can I share my other uh, yes. gizmo here? Um, yeah. Um, so this is the mic that, that I'm using now. Uh, it goes for about $260, uh, which in the realm of microphones is, is not a lot. Uh, it's not nothing, but I, I think it's a good value uh, for that kind of money. Now, um, <clears throat> next level up, this is another popular USB mic. Well, this one and it's on Amazon, but all the prices were the same everywhere. Look, $130. So it's half the price of it. Now, I have to say I have not used this one. Uh, I know a lot of people do like it. This would certainly be a 
We can't see what you're looking at, so can you? Oh, um, uh, sorry. Um, I thought if I was. Oof. that work any better yeah, yeah okay, really okay sorry all right i'll just go back real fast here's the uh the apogee which i'm using um uh 260 here is the the blue yeti which a lot of people use and it's like half that price so you know th this i would definitely put in the realm of affordable i can't speak to if you know if you google i, I saw somebody oh comparing the <clears throat> the Blue Yeti to the Apogee, um, you know, it would be worth uh, poking around to see what people's opinions are. Um, <clears throat> then moving up the ladder, you know, this is what I would call a, um, you know, a real professional microphone um, because it's it's based on a, a long lineage of, of uh, Neumann mics or like this. And I say it's about eight hundred dollars a piece now where this mic type shines is if you go this route if you want to do stereo it's it's really important if you're trying to capture in stereo an instrument in a space to have mics that are are very linear off axis is what we say you know it's not just that they sound good straight on but you know the sound quality it it may be attenuated, but the, the character is still clear as you get off axis. And when you're working in stereo, you need mics that do that because they're working together. So <clears throat> they sell these as a stereo set. And this, this set uh, was priced at 1500 which is really not bad because that's less than one of the Sheps mics, for instance. Um, so that again that kind of depends on whether you're just trying to lay down a, a you know an a audition or a demo or you want to make a, a full-blown uh, stereo recording um i'll just uh, on the equipment end of it here is the uh oh you know one of the many zoom things i just find these a little frustrating to use <laughs> because the the buttons are all small and the knobs and the metering and the um and I also don't care for this mic arrangement. Um, so, you know, it's an option. It's long been, you know, it has a, a long history now. But um, here is like a current model of a Tascam. And, and this is uh, less than $200 also. This is not, not an expensive box. And this will plug into to any uh, uh, computer. Uh, now, Jim will speak about, he, I believe, owns this, and uh, it, it is definitely a step up in the realm of audio gear. It's, it's not, um, you know, tremendously expensive. These seem to be about, well, they have some heritage versions and whatnot, uh, <clears throat> under $1,000 at least, about $900, or, and there are some fancier models that, are, that seem to go up, uh, you know, over 1000 so anyway, those are some of the, the basic models. There's certainly many more, but the microphone is important. And um, I think it's worth putting some, some money into it. And especially with something like this, you can't go wrong. And, I, and one thing that's absolute certain is of all the audio gear, all of it becomes worthless eventually except microphones. Microphones always maintain their value. I mean, I, I, my 184s are like almost 30 years old now, and it's, they're just as good as they were, and they're still popular. You'd always be able to sell them, is the bottom line. So, anything else before we? I think that's great for now. Okay. Move on to Jim, and then I know every we still have questions coming in, um, but we are going to get to more of them at the end. Okay. All right, my turn, right? 
<laughs> That's great stuff, Larry. Um, yeah, I really love that um, that interface that you mentioned. Um, so I just want to give a little background on how uh, how I ended up here. <laughs> uh, it's very gracious of Nikki to call me an overdubbing genius, although that seems a little <laughs> um, a little strong. Um, before I get too far along, um, just want to make sure everybody should feel comfortable uh, messaging, putting in the chat if they can't hear me or if they're having, if I need to speak a little louder, uh, I'll try and monitor that as best I can. Um, so I am the second trombone player in the Pittsburgh Symphony, but I'm also the utility player, which basically is just sort of a fancy way to say that I'm the mix, Mr. Fix-It of the section. So like at times I, I primarily play second, but um, I play first, I play bass trombone, um, and so I just kind of move around the section as needed. Um, in fact, when the Pittsburgh Symphony recorded the Beethoven Fifth Symphony years ago, I started the week on bass trombone and ended the week on first. So um, that can that can kind of happen, depends on the position. You know, I know um, uh, Nikki's husband, Colin, does, a, does very much the same thing. He probably, he, and he even plays the valve stuff, which I, I don't have the dexterity for that. Um, but I want to uh, give you background about how I ended up doing the overdubbing stuff. So um, basically it started when um, I, was in, I was in the Utah Symphony before the Pittsburgh Symphony and I did a recording session for, um, it was a studio in town that uh, records movie soundtracks and video game so scores and stuff like that. And I did the, all the trombone parts for one of the World of Warcraft games. Like I played all five trombone parts that this guy wrote. And that kind of planted the seed in my head to be like, you know, this is kind of fun. And um, so about eight and a half years ago, I started, uh, it was the, it was about August uh, of, of that season. And I, I'm, in, I'm in my 12th season in the Pittsburgh Symphony. So it was about eight and a half years ago. Um, I was looking for a fun way to kind of get in shape for the season. You know, I, um, you know, most of you guys are way too young to be thinking this way yet. Um, but as you get older, it becomes a little more, a little difficult to just pull out the old etude book. You're, you're kind of looking for more fun, engaging ways to keep your practicing going. Um, and for years, I've done all these uh, kind of crazy arrangements of uh, various pieces for trombone ensemble. And trombone ensemble is, you know, uh, usually made up of tenor and bass trombones, but it can have alto trombones, contra bass trombones, you name it. Um, and I thought maybe, you know, I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. I had no idea what I was doing. And I basically just um, jumped into the deep end of the pool and, and, and took one of my arrangements and I just used uh, Audacity, to, you know, free download, and I used a simple USB mic, very much, very similar to the one I'm talking to you on right now. So I didn't start with all kinds of expensive, fancy gear because I really didn't know what I was doing. And I didn't, I figured I should get more skill before I really um, upgrade my equipment. But um, I'm going to. I'm going to play for you a little clip. And uh, um, before I do that, though, I want to share a story. My, I'm, I'm in this very interesting phase in my life where the older I get, the smarter my dad gets. And uh, I will never tell him that. But um, uh, no, I love my dad. Uh, but when I was a little kid, I came home with a report card. You know, there were these things called report cards back then. And it was all A's and one B plus. And he was like, what is this? These should be all A's, you know? And uh, he didn't say it in a mean way. He just kind of was like, you know, you know you can do better. And I was like, oh, you know, I did the best I could or whatever. And he goes, no excuses. There are 24 hours in a day. You will find a way to make the impossible possible. And I was like, Ugh, groan, who talks like that? You know, it's like a caricature, you know. So fast forward to this overdub stuff. And uh, this clip I'm going to play for you is something I literally recorded in this house on my own and um, the percussion parts you're going to hear I recorded uh, 
former colleague of mine, Ed Steffen, he's the timpanist in the San Francisco Symphony. He recorded all the percussion parts, but I did it the exact same way that I record myself. So I'm going to share with you this, this clip. Um, I did that in my living room <laughs> pretty impossible you know now I uh, I'm gonna put in the chat um, it is uh, somebody asked what that piece was that is the planet Krypton fanfare from the original Star Wars film I mean so, oh, sorry original Superman film <laughs> uh, the Christopher Reeve Superman film it's one of my favorite moments and it's it's the very beginning uh, of the film after the credits as they're approaching the, the planet and it's just an incredible moment um, and when I first started overdubbing, I did uh, something much, you know, not quite as crazy as that. Um, so I'm going to put in the chat a, um, this is a video that I made, uh, and you can refer back to it. To kind of, it it's basically, it's called Overdubbing for Beginners. And it's a step-by-step -step process on how to, you know, basically set up uh, a home setup and, and how to overdub and how to sort of divide and conquer. Because basically I do it in small chunks, um, you know, f four to eight bars at a time, that kind of thing. And, and it, 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 there's some basic mastering and, and uh, editing kind of stuff in that video. It's about 13 minutes long and uh, you can find it on my YouTube page, but I'm going to put it in the in the chat here. So if, if some of you can't access the chat or can't see it, it's, it's on my YouTube page. Just look for my name, James Nova. Um, it's called Overdubbing for Beginners, and it'll give you a real simple primer on how to get started and if if you if any of you have any questions about anything in that video like you're confused about anything please feel free to email me i won't respond but you can email me no i'm just kidding uh, of course i'll respond i i love it's one of my favorite things to do and you know i started this eight and a half years ago so as you can imagine when the pandemic hit it was like all of a sudden this was a globally relevant skill set that i had you know and uh my inbox was was uh, quite flooded, quite flooded. Um, but what I'm going to do now is I'm going to you might be wondering, OK, I'm not really interested in doing any multi track overdub kind of stuff, you know, but what can I do with this technology, you know, to help me practice or help me uh, improve, you know, my excerpts or whatever, you know, get ready for an audition or a performance and that kind of thing. And as we all know, the two major gateways in uh, being successful in the mu music business uh, are rhythm and pitch, rhythm and pitch. So if you, you, you have to have a certain level of competency in those two areas to even be in the game. Um, and so what I end up doing is when I'm practicing um, any kind of piece that, you know, I'm, you know, trying to fine tune, I always start with, with drones. 
with tuning drones. Now, I'm going to share with you, uh, you know, one of the one of the most um, asked excerpts for tenor or bass trombone is the Ride of the Valkyries, and the reason that that excerpt is asked is that it prevent it presents many challenges with intonation because generally you're playing a B flat instrument in the key of B major. So uh, what I what I did is I took the um, the part um, the major section the, it's in this this is a make sure you can see that so and I basically went through and uh, you know figured out what what chords would help me kind of be a have a guardrail for working on intonation now I'm a serious tech nerd when it comes to this stuff and and what I'm holding here if you can see it, I'm not sure. You know, all of you can see it in the in the with the screen share on, but it's a it's a Bluetooth page turner, and I have it set up to run iTunes, you know, and it can run any media player if you're on a PC. It doesn't matter. Actually, actually, run your phone too if you if you pair it to your phone, and I find this to be an extremely efficient way to work on intonation, and I'm going to show you how that works. All right, so. You, I'm going to be going off this, but I want to. I'm going to stop the share now. And uh, if you hear this drone here, okay. Now that is a tuning drone that I recorded. I overdubbed that and then basically spliced it into a long five-minute track. Any of you can do that. And, and especially uh, with using that video I shared, if you go there, it'll, it'll explain how to, how, to, how to do a simple overdub. You can record yourself and it's great, great work for you to you know, do that because then when you're tuning, working on intonation, I'm a big believer in working on drones with intonation, not a tuner. Because I think a tuner t uh, works your eyes, not your ears. <laughs> and uh, you know, we're always trying to find um, you know where the where the center of the pitch is especially when it comes to like excerpts like the ride of the valkyries because you got so many chords that are spelled out by the melody and knowing when to when to tune that and, and such now um i have a phrase that i always use with when it comes to uh, uh many things but especially intonation working on good intonation is not a destination it's a lifestyle you're always kind of a, you know trying to make it happen um I've done lots of virtual recordings uh, over the, during the pandemic and, you know, nobody plays perfectly in tune. Nobody. So it's never a, it's never a destination. It's more of a, just a, a maintenance, you know, you just have to stay on it. So I'm going to, I'm going to use the ride of the Valkyries as a way to show you how to work on intonation with drones. Now see this Bluetooth page turner, every time I hit the, uh, the, the track, So like, I don't even have to take my hands off my instrument. It's just a foot pedal. So I just move, put this on the ground here. And now I'm gonna reshare that, that uh, clip again. And you'll see here that. You see that um, that's a lot more fun. Um, it's a lot more fun than working on, uh, you know, working with a tuner because you get you get much more interactive feel of how your sound fits, and that's why I really recommend recording your own drones because if you have if you're doing your own drones, then you are working on your intonation just to create those, 
And then when you work on your excerpts or such, I just put them in an order that uh, the excerpt and that, that way I'm, I'm literally blending with my own sound. I'm blending with an actual person, not just a tonal energy or something like that. Now, the, the next step is we've got the, the pitch happening. Now we're gonna, gonna add the rhythm aspect of it. And um, for that, I now put the drones, I, uh, uh, oh, okay. There's a question about how do I, t how do I pair the duo with iTunes like that? Um, this is a little tricky. Uh, the, the way it come, the way that the pedal comes n from the factory, it's, it's actually backwards. You, you just have to ask them to program it so that it can run, run a media player. And it's a $5 upcharge. You know, the amount of time that it saves is well worth it. <laughs> Um, so yeah, just in fact, if you contact uh, Airturn, just tell them you want Jim Nova's programming, because that's that's what I they, they have a file on it, and so they can just pull that up and they'll know exactly. Uh, I'm sure they have other files on me too, but um, but that's the that's the um, best way to to get that to happen. Um, Jim, Jim, sorry, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. What about the flick button? Would that work? Uh, yeah, yeah, that actually is programmable. So yeah, I actually for a while had the flick button right here on my horn and I would just put a little Velcro piece and just like put it in my case. And that works really, it's a little slower than the air turn. The air turn's a little more immediate. Um, but uh, yeah, you can't, I mean, there's a question about the duo running at the, running the page turner option at the same time. It can't, it doesn't do that. It's gotta do one or the other. Um, but that flick button that, that Nikki mentioned is, is pretty cheap. Um, and that you can, you can just load up on the gear, right? So, um, okay. Now I want to, uh, talk about the, putting the, the rhythm aspect into this mix. Okay. Um, let's see here. Okay. So you'll see that now I added a click track to this. This is just using audacity. So there's no, uh, no cost barrier here. Audacity is a free download. And I believe it was created at, at Carnegie Mellon University. I believe CMU was the, the it's a CMU engineering project. Um, totally free open source software, PC or Mac. Um, and here's what this sounds like when you put the chords together with what I just played. <laughs> say you want to take that and slow it down you know maybe you, you know you want to you want to spend a little more time lingering on each note well it's very simple you just select uh the the area of this track that i created now keep in mind this is the finished product i dropped the drones into this session and then trimmed them down and then mixed them down and uh if you watch that overdubbing video i told you about it, it'll it'll be very simple to see how that works um now under effects, you can slow the tempo of this track without changing the pitch. So let's say you wanna go you know, 30% slower. It does mar the audio slightly, but for practice purposes, it's no, no problem. So then it's just. Playing with those kind of drones and, and doing that kind of thing really um, helps because you are learning on the fly how to adjust your intonation, and that is that is what it means to be good good and to have good intonation. There is no I am in tune and you are in tune. There is we are in tune, and the more you can learn that kind of skill, uh, you know, going forward, like if, especially for you win brass players, um, you know. My audition for the PSO was one in the section round. And um, I have a fun, uh, boy, this might be an overload, but like, actually, you know what? There's so many attendees, I'm not gonna ask. The, I usually ask people to put in the chat to guess what number audition the PSO was for me, like of all my professional orchestra auditions. And I've had successes along the way, of course, but Pittsburgh Symphony was my 39th professional orchestra audition. 
So success in this industry is not all about talent. It's about grit. It's like how many times can you stand up, brush yourself off and keep moving forward? You know, in fact, Nikki put a, a fun set of quotes from Rocky of all uh, you know, Rocky Balboa today uh, talking about that very thing. OK, so intonation stuff is is so vital and your ability to adjust, you know, um, and the use of drones when I, I mean, it's it's just invaluable, you know, because in the in the final round of the PSO, there was a section round and our music director asked me after the audition, he said, have you played with these guys or have you know, do you. I played one concert with our tuba player like about six years before that audition, but that's it. I'd never played with any of the guys in the section. And that's the key. That's the that's that little incremental stuff. And if you create drones to, um, you know, uh, help you with that, it's just invaluable. OK, I'm going to stop here. Let me see if there's some questions. OK, we're doing good. All right. Now, the next step is I want to talk a little bit about um, my my philosophy about playing and and you know, experiencing music, essentially. Like, I learned this from uh, a, a dear friend and old, or my old teacher, uh, Norman Bolter. And basically, the experiencing art exists and, and performing art experiences, it, it's, it basically breaks down to three layers and balancing those three layers. You know, the first layer is your mechanics and technique, you know, good sound and uh, posture, good breathing, all that kind of stuff. And then the second layer is intellect and choice, you know, seeing a forte in Mahler, playing it different than a forte in Mozart and those kind of things, but reading the code. And the problem is that um, many of us just sort of uh, go that far and then don't go any further. And the last layer I think is the most important because I would be willing to bet that nobody in this meeting or watching uh, is has gone into music or is interested in music in order to play perfectly in tune and in time. That is not the reason we go into music. We go into music because it moves us. It ex we have an experience with it. And good rhythm and pitch are just servants to that end. And we forget that. And one of the times where it becomes the most difficult is when we try to make a recording. Because all of a sudden, we have unlimited chances and people, you know, sometimes talk, oh, well, this is, I don't know why this isn't better. You had unlimited chances. And it's like, well, yeah, that can be a straitjacket if you're not careful. You know, it, it can, re you get so caught up in trying to make, you know, a perfect recording that um, it doesn't say anything, doesn't have any meaning to it. You know, uh, another, another phrase that I learned from, uh, uh, like, if you guys want to remember anything from me today, it's there's going to be there's going to be two phrases that you that I want you to remember. One, always start with what you can do and build on that. That is the most important thing to start. And then secondly, if the music doesn't mean anything to you, how's it going to mean anything to anyone else? And trust me, when you are listening, I mean, I have sat on many audition panels for both, you know, from the PSO all the way down to like, you know, high school competitions and stuff, you know, in terms of level. And I will tell you that great musicianship and exciting music making will always win out over somebody who's just playing a flawless robotic performance. That will always win, you know, because uh, it doesn't matter if it's perfect, if it doesn't say anything. People don't get moved by that, you know. I mean, that's what I love. <laughs> I know some of my PSO colleagues are watching and I, that's what I love about, uh, and I know the New York Philharmonic's like this too, you know, the, the PSO is like, it's one of those orchestras that will, will gladly sacrifice technical perfection for an exciting performance. You know, they'll, they'll kind of push it to the edge a little bit, you know, or even times, many times well over the edge. And that's fine because that's what we got into music for. That's what we got into music for. So now that I've shared with you a little, um, Superman stuff. I'm going to continue on that front because I want to show you something. Um, I want to I want to address that this idea about the music meaning something to you. It has to have some in, some meaning to you. And I'm going to use the Superman mythology as a as a jumping off point. Okay. So what I find interesting about the whole Superman mythology is it's the reverse of most superhero characters. Like Superman is really Superman, and his alter ego is Clark Kent. 
right? It's not the other way around. Usually it's like, you know, Batman is Bruce Wayne and his alter ego is Batman, right? So, um, and I feel like John Williams, I mean, I'm such a huge John Williams fan, you know, he really captures that in music. Now, what I decided to do was I, I, pre, I, I pre-recorded a, a little clip of uh, the Superman March, this arrangement that I did. It's a continuation of that recording that I uh, just played for you earlier. And I just thought about playing in tune in time. I just tried to make sure that I did all hit all the notes, nice, clear articulations and such. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to share with you that clip. Let me make sure I had the right zoom enabled. OK, OK. <laughs> Perfectly solid, you know, in time, good intonation, blah, blah, blah. As boring as it gets, you know, like just, just, I really tried hard. It's really hard because this music really makes my, you know, gets my blood up as it were, right? So now I'm going to, I'm going to show you the next part, which now I really tried to connect to what I wanted the music to say. I really wanted to, I really kind of wanted to, you know, embrace the heroic character and you know this noble person who's trying to do good and this is and this is what happened <laughs> now yeah you can say that oh i played it a little louder a little more aggressive but i wasn't thinking that i was really thinking about what i want the music to say and to further make that point, I want to I want to show you another little clip. This is a scene from the movie, actually. Right. And I want you to pay very close attention to when you hear the actual Superman theme start. Now, this scene is when I'm going to skip ahead a little bit uh, to the spot. This scene is when Lois Lane has gotten into this helicopter and it's caught this wire and it's crashed on the side of the building. And she's basically about to fall to her death. And. Clark Kent has not revealed Superman to the world yet. He has not, no one, no one knows that who he is. And there's a moment where he realizes that he has to, he has to step in. He has to step in, all right? Let's skip ahead a little bit, just so in the interest of time. So she's hanging in the helicopter, okay? <laughs> Okay, folks, come on, hold it, get back. Come on, come on, don't sleep, folks. Come on, get back. So that's all I'm going to play of that. But like that always, that scene always gives me goosebumps. I'm always like, like when he's revealed, you know, and it's just awesome. And then I put that into my mind really strongly. And now what that does is it aligns your pitch, rhythm and technique, all that practice that you've done. It puts it in the background. And now the most upfront feature is the musicianship, the make the, the excitement The you know, I have scrapped entire sections of an overdub because I got done and I'm like, well, it's technically solid, but it's just not exciting, you know? And 
so this that same clip I played for you before that was like okay and then a little better. This was the final product. Okay. Um. So that first one I played for you, it's good, whatever. But that one makes me want to run through a wall, you know. And that's what you want to put out there when you're playing, when you're making these audition recordings. Like, perfect is the enemy of great. Perfect is the enemy of great. Remember that. And um, you will get a lot of leeway from a committee or an, a, a, you know, if you if they can hear that you are just going for things, just just doing what you what you can to get the most exciting performance. Like my philosophy about recording, and it's funny, I wish I wish I had done the overdubbing stuff when I was a student because it would have changed the way I approach recording my audition recordings and stuff like that. But um, get uh, what I, my philosophy is get the most exciting take you can that just happens to be technically solid rather than just approaching it as like, oh, I need to make this perfect. Cause that just, it's like a trash compactor. It just crushes you. And then eventually you're like, I hate all these takes and I bet the reason you hate them is because they're boring. And so if you don't have anything excitement going on in the playing, then all that's left is rhythm and pitch. Then when one thing goes out of tune or whatever, it's like all is lost. You know, I, I have never played an audition in my life that was technically perfect because like I said, you know, refinement is refining your playing is not a destination. It's a lifestyle, you know. But okay, I'm getting a question about um, what plugins for reverb I use. Well, believe it or not, that Superman recording that was long before I I was on Logic Pro, but it was before I got my fancy, better plugins that I used for my Star Wars album. Um, I use a per, I use a plugin called Nimbus, which is not cheap. Just that soft, just that reverb software is two hundred dollars, and uh, so. But that Superman recording, guess where the reverb for that recording came from? Garage band. <laughs> so this is what I mean. You you know, like focus on getting the playing to a place that's really exciting and then people will want to listen to it. I mean it it's I it's the only reason I can account for my SoundCloud having over a million listens is that people hear that I'm just really trying to go for every note. And that just feeds into your your orchestra playing and your your chamber music playing and your solo recordings for auditions and such. So um all right, well that's my that's my spiel. So uh, I'm sure we have a lot of questions. Um, yeah, so definitely question time. And uh, I want to start with one that um, for either of you, you know, Larry was talking about where to put the mics and, and different things. But mm. how do you know that you are set up correctly? What kinds of things are you listening for when you're testing your mic and testing the levels? How does the player know, oh, that's in the right place? and the levels are set correctly, what are you listening for? What tests do you do? Um, I mean, I, I'm happy to give my amateur opinion first because <laughs> I'm an amateur. I'm, uh, I'm I have just enough skill to be dangerous. Um, and what I found was in, in my particular setup, um, it was important that I'm off access to the, to the wall. Like uh, if you think of this, this chat, this box as the, the room that I record in, I like set up maybe in this corner and point that way at that angle and then put the mic there. My, the, my living room and kitchen are, are one big shoebox shaped room. So I it, it's a nice combination of reflective and and absorbent, you know, carpet and stuff. Um, but quite honestly, I played around with different mic placements. I, I tried my basement and, you know, if it sounds good, it is good. So I, I think use your, you, you guys listen to a lot of recordings, I hope. And um, 
for me, I found that about, I actually found that since I'm a orchestral player and I'm kind of set up to play in an orchestra, I found that I needed the mic to be about 12 feet in front of me, um, off axis at shoulder level. And uh, well, what did you hear? And, and for Larry too, and I want to make sure that we talk about what the yeah. string players need, but you know, what are the, what is an example of a badly placed mic for a violin or viola? What are some things that you're not going to hear or things that you are going to hear and how can you tell as an, as a novice, that you're set up correctly. Hmm. What sort of test should you be doing? You want to take that one, Larry? Yeah, I, I smiled when you asked because uh, this is the uh, age-old question. You know, you're in a recording session and you do sound checks. You start adjusting mics. You move a little closer, a little farther, yeah, whatever. And then there's at this point at which you say, "I'm only going to make it worse." And and I guess that's the instinct of a professional doing it is knowing that, you know what, it's probably not going to get any better. But as far as to how, how to quantify it, I think just having a sense of, number one, the natural sound of the instrument. You know, what, what is this, this thing, you know, uh, the sarusophone or whatever it is that you, you have in your mind's ear of what it should sound like. And so that you're not distracted, as it were, by the sound of the room or the lack of the sound of the room. You know, if it sounds too close so that you're you're not able to think of it as an instrument in a, in a space. It's really hard to to describe, but there shouldn't be something obviously wrong with it. I guess that's that's it. And it's it's tough at home because it's not like you're working in a wonderful perfect recital hall where you you, you think you're going to find the holy grail but you have to know that there isn't something that you can't fix about it you can't add reverb to it you can't eq out the problem and i think that's a good starting point is just to make sure that it's not not obviously uh wrong just in its basic sound Okay. I think there was a, a question at some point about um, using pairs of microphones for things. Uh, like I think I, I saw I at least saw that a few times in in that document that you sent that the, the pre the pre uh, loaded questions as it were. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I, I'm pretty sure my my symphony colleague Micah Wilkinson asked something about that. Like I I mean personally, when I'm recording an overdub, I don't. I just use one mic because I'm going to be like placing it around a session anyway. But even I did a video recently for the school of brass, right? It was basically a second trombone video, like what you need to do to work on second trombone. And I recorded a bunch of excerpts at the end and I just used one mic because I figure the kind of the, the students who are going to be listening to this are going to have one mic, you know, um, and maybe kind of live in that world. I mean, granted a really good mic, <laughs> um, but Larry, I, I'd love to hear what you do about, different like putting because I have a pair of good microphones and I figure if I ever want to record solos or anything like that I would probably want to put one in a different place than my normal position to kind of get a little more three-dimensional sound uh, I'd love to hear your answer to that since I'm an admitted amateur yeah uh, the question of two mics on an instrument I, I guess the, the differentiation is whether you're just talking about putting two mics on an instrument in any context or whether you're talking about, you know, recording a stereo, uh, you know, an event, as it were, in other words, capturing the space that uh, you're in. Uh, uh, in either, well, obviously, if you're doing the latter, if you're trying to capture this, this event, a recital, a concert or whatever, then you have to know that you have the you know good mics and they're in the in a position to get kind of this natural uh, you know contextual sound. Now, if you're just you're trying to get something other than a mono pickup on an instrument, uh, my feeling is that if you're trying to use you know what are some typical stereo techniques like uh, typically is what they call the XY 
uh, it's not not my favorite because uh, I think it it ends up being not much better than mono. It, it, there's just kind of a narrowness to it, and it's really meant to to work over a space because if you think about it. Yeah, I, it may be good that the neither mic is exactly aiming on axis, but they're like two two off axis. Um, if you're you're trying to get something other than this mono, I find that parallel mics, like two hmm. two mics that are um, you know cardioid but parallel, <clears throat> and you know they can be, you have to be a little careful of the distance, but typically, you know, it's about the width of your head, really. Uh, but in parallel, it's not like a stereo array like you would see written about or something, but <coughs> I've seen plenty of um, recordings made with, you know, Anna Sophie Muter and, you know, all kinds of major soloists, and the guys will put out a couple of mics parallel and both aimed at the instrument. And that way you're not getting a lot of room that you can't control, but you're, you have the ability to get some kind of spaciousness out of it. It's not just mono. So that's why I say is to, um, uh, someone had a question actually about piano also. Um, and I, I would said for him, uh, I think it was in, anyway, 18 inches. Uh, in, he's working in his basement or something, but, um, you know, space enough, but both of them aimed into that uh, instrument um, and and not get crazy with angles. Now, one thing I didn't talk about were patterns of mics. Um, mm. Omnidirectional mics, by their very nature, have the most pure sound, and we use them when we can. But they don't work well in all space. I mean, they work great in a big concert hall, but in your home, not so much. Uh, they'll pick up noise, and also, again, you'll really hear the walls. Uh, so so they're, you know, directional mics are better. <clears throat> if you get into the fine points of all this, one of my favorite mics is actually a mic that's in between a cardioid and an omni, and it's called... Uh, properly a sub cardioid now like sure or somebody would call it a semi cardioid but same difference it has the warmth of, of an omni mic but it's a little more controllable and Sheps makes an excellent one it's called the MK21 uh, that's the model of the capsule so I, I just put that out there. I think it's going to be more expensive, but if you get into the realm of making recordings for release, uh, you might want to have a, a weapon like that because uh, also someone asked about string quartet. They're wonderful mics to use as a main array, a main pair, um, because really all of the, the recordings, other than maybe a mono audition recording, uh, the main mics the, are absolutely crucial. All of the, the fine tuning of the spot mics is incidental because you should never use much of those spot mics. But that's a whole other thing of making, uh, you know, complete stereo product uh, type recordings. We could have another webinar on that. <laughs> so if any of the fellows have a question, Give you a couple seconds, and if there we go, Isaiah has a question. I think you can unmute yourself. Hi, yes, thank you all so much for your presentations. Um, my question is just for not um, if you're doing a performance um, to be live streamed that's not pre recorded, do you have any suggestions for any um, audio considerations for a live stream performance? Well, I know that, I mean, the Pittsburgh Symphony has been doing a bunch of these Sunday Night Live performances and people have varying qualities of gear. Um, and I'd be curious to hear what Larry thinks, but it seems to me that because of the compressions that happened on Zoom and Facebook Live and Instagram and such, that like I, I set up all my, you know, my Neumann microphones with the great interface with the gold plated cables and blah, blah, blah. You know, I set all that up and I did a, I did a couple couple streaming performances like that 
and it when I listened to the archive of video, it sounded like exactly the same as my USB mic sounded because a little less noise, a tiny little bit less noise because the signal is more pure. But the amount of difference was so small because, like Larry said, so many people are taking in music through their phones or through air, you know, AirPods or earbuds or whatever. It's like it doesn't matter how good. I, I mean, I. <laughs> doesn't matter how good the, the product is if the person listening is not actually using that great a set of headphones or anything like that. I mean, I totally agree with Larry on uh, I I have to when I'm finished with an overdub or any kind of recording, I put it through several filters. I, I listen to it on my stereo. I listen to it on my good headphones. I listen to it on my AirPods. I listen to it in my car. I listen to it on my phone. And if you're kind of unhappy with all of them, you're probably in the right place, you know. You know, because it's just like, uh, I mean, you know, I, I say that jokingly, but it's like you can't satisfy everything. Although what's interesting about that kind of a filter is that you hear different things, you know, different things get accentuated that you might be like, ooh, that articulation is not so good. I got to think I can go back and do do that again, you know, that kind of thing. So for live stream, I think if you've got a good, you know, quality USB mic in the $200 range, you can you're not going to, I don't think you're going to see a huge jump if you set up, you know, a pair of $1,800 microphones with an $800 interface and blah, blah, blah. You know, I just don't, I can't appreciate a huge difference, you know, a huge difference. And that's with listening to good, with good headphones on my end, listening back to them. So, uh, you know, I'd be curious to hear what Larry thinks. I think he's probably maligns it as much as I do. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I've always been of the uh, belief that, y you know, it's sort of, uh, as it was in early computer technology, Gigo, you know, garbage in, garbage out. Um, <laughs> and that that dates back to uh, pre-DOS, I think. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> I, you know, maybe it's just me wanting to think I'm not wasting my time, but... I, I do believe that when, you know, I record at 96K, I do all of this stuff, and even knowing that it's going to end up coming out of, a, you know, people's phones, I, I do believe you're working with sharper tools uh, is one way of putting it. Uh, my friends at Sound Mirror would say that. Um, and so you should give it the same care. Now, do you have to spend a lot of money on mics? No, not necessarily. But um, you want to handle it right because, in a way, the the kind of data compression that that these streaming uh, you know formats and they're all they each have their quirks of YouTube and Facebook and so on. Uh, <clears throat> but it can amplify as were problems that were in the original sound. Uh, so it, it's, it's still worth being careful. I, that's my feeling. Uh, and, and I know, well, that another with the inside out of what Jim was saying in some ways, if you have a, a really good recording, I mean, my favorite recordings of all time, let's say they sound good on everything. And that's nice when it happens, but it, um, yeah, you you start by saying, okay, well, I don't hear a real problem here. And then you listen to different speakers or in the car. The car is actually a good place because it's somewhere between, you know, speakers in a room and AirPods. Um, but, you know, when you start to to uh, moderate the, the, the problems in each situation, you can end up with something that sounds good everywhere. That should be the goal. Oh, Nicholas. Hi. Um, so more and more festivals and orchestras are requiring uh, a mixture of audio and video uh, or just uh, video with audio alone. So what, uh, what kind of microphones would you recommend for uh for for video and audio take like combined 
Um, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll take a quick stab at this. I, I think that um, what I like to do is do them separately, you know, like, or capture them separately. I mean, you know, like the, I mean, I have the current iPhone has a pretty amazing camera in it actually. <laughs> um, so but what you have to be careful of is, is the, the trap of the frame rates being variable and such that can be a little bit of a drag. Um, but you know, something like iMovie or something you can put, if you capture the recording, um, and then have like the iPhone just videoing you, you can put them together at the end. Uh, you know, and the simple, <laughs> the simple way to do it is, uh, is just clap your hands. And then when you put the audio of the video and the audio that you captured together, you can find that spike and line them up and uh, get them pretty close, you know, like, and then you can fine tune it in there. And then, then you're producing a pretty good, that's how I do it. That's, that's what I do when I'm recording videos. Cause I got more into videos during the pandemic um, and solving those little problems. It's a slippery slope because you don't want to, I mean, the editing ability now is so good that there, there's all these festivals are saying, you know, oh, you need to make sure that you don't, you know, no editing between takes or whatever. And I'm like, uh, so that becomes a philosophical question. Um, I believe you should stick to the rules because eventually you're going to be in person and you don't want to be the guy who shows up and doesn't sound anything like your recording did or nowhere near as, as solid, you know, as good. That's where that whole exciting playing thing comes back, you know, like that, that, that kind of shows up again. Um, but yeah, I, I do them at the same time, like have the video and the audio captured at the same time, putting them, putting them in together later. I'll throw it out there before we do another question that I've asked Jim for microphone suggestions before, and he suggested one that's only like $99, a USB microphone. Um, and there's actually an adapter that can go into your iPhone that's supposed to be for a camera, but you can plug the USB mic into your phone and you can use the external microphone while taking video on your phone. Um, and Colin and I use that for some stuff over the summer. Right, and Aurora, yeah, next question. Hi everyone, Jim, Lawrence, thank you so much for sharing all of your incredible experience and knowledge with us. It's, it's, it's greatly appreciated. My question is going to Jim, actually. I noticed that you have the Apollo Twin X interface. And um, my question to you is when you, let's say you're recording an audition um, directly from the microphone into your DAW, and it's an audio recording. Um, are you utilizing any of the preamps that the Apollo Twin is famous for? For example, I know they have like a ton of uh, preamps that you can access via Logic or whatever DAW you're using. And um, I just want my, I guess my question is, how are you uh, treating the audio post uh, in post? And before you send it out to for an audition panel, because of course, like it should be raw audio, I would assume. But if you're utilizing uh, an interface such as the Apollo Twin that is famous for its pre, like it's like Rupert Neve preamps you can access and things like that, what are how are you recording into it, and what is what is uh, permissible? Thank you. Sure, sure. Um, I. Um... I, I keep it pretty stripped down. Like I, I really don't use any any of those plugins uh, when I'm. I really want as as simple and straightforward a, a, a audio capture as I can get because um, I find that with some of those plugins, it does it can do weird things to the sound. Like uh, you know, accentuate certain things that you don't want accentuated. <laughs> um, and um, as far as for an audition. If you you know if I were a student making an audition recording or something you know I would I would stay away from doing much to the sound after the fact you know I mean I guess if somebody sent me a recording and it had a teeny bit of reverb added just to kind of make up for the 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 dead room they're playing in or whatever it wouldn't really bother me that much uh, I mean I, technically that would be not pure you know like you're not actually recording in a room but. Um, I don't see a problem with that. For me, it's more about like you feeling like you're sending in a real representation of what you sound like and play like, you know, and, and as long as you're staying true to that, I feel like, you know, 
that that's okay. But yeah, you're right. There's a there's a zillion things in that uh, in that uh, interface and the software on the back end. I mean, I could talk about people have asked me how I do the vo the processing of those overdubs, and, and it's like there's all kinds of alchemy that goes on in post that you can make it sound like it's happening in a like my goal for my recordings is to make them sound like the most incredibly well rehearsed trombone choir playing in like a, a medium to large size hall that's what i try to capture and i don't add a ton of like other effects but you know sample delaying if you guys if any of you want to d deep dive into that kind of thing like panning and sample delaying it's also called the haas effect um and Another thing I do is a little bit of high EQ roll off on each track to kind of take some of the splash of the room out. Um, but I'm not sure if I would do a whole lot of that in terms of an audition recording. You know, I would I would probably I know it's hard to find space right now, but I would probably try to find a decent room to play in so that people could, you know, get a real sense of what you sound like. You know, I'm, not sure, I'm curious what Larry thinks about that. Uh, yeah, I I tend to not use a lot of um, uh, processing. Uh, now, when we were putting together these, um, you know, 80 or 100 iPhone video recordings, um, then, yeah, I, sometimes you, you've got to do some things to try and tame the sound. Um, but uh, for one thing, in, in the re original recording, I, you know, want to record everything as flat as possible and and be, uh, you know, really careful about mic choice and mic placement so that you don't have to do processing. But I mean, I, I guess I have a sort of a purist uh, uh, attitude about it, but um, it also, you know, I'm usually working in spaces that the you know, instrument has a chance to uh, to sound proper, in, you know, the way you would want it. Um, and sometimes you, you have to do things that are, um, yeah, not natural to, to get it to the way you want it. And sometimes you just want to do it for creative uh, reasons to, to distort it. Uh, so, yeah. Lots of famous uh, music have been made out using distortion, God knows, the guitar and so on. Do we have any more questions? I have one if we don't. Catherine. Sorry, I was unmuted for a second there. Um, so I always have a question with regards to recording like in a house or in a small room or just, you know, not an ideal studio setting. What are your recommendations with mics, with setting up, what kind of room to try to find in a house? Just sort of like, what are your recommendations for that? Uh, you know, I can take that. I, I uh, try to address that. I would say the largest, quietest room you have. Um, such that uh, the room doesn't get in the way of what you're trying to do. Um, and I noticed you're, you're sitting in a room where there were bookshelves and so on. Uh, those shelves provide diffusion and diffusion's good. What you don't want to do is just go into an empty room that just has walls because you'll, you'll hear the reflections very specifically. So, uh, I'd say, uh, you know, a good size room, obviously quiet is always paramount because then you can work with it later. Um, I hope that's, that's helpful. Um, preferably not something that has a low ceiling, you know, if, uh, a nice big space if you have it. So we've already gone over, but one last kind of summation question for both of you is what advice do you have for people doing this for the first time well i mean considering <laughs> if you want to hear what can happen um if you're curious like go, if you go to my soundcloud page i i 
uh, encourage you to listen to the first Superman March recording that I did. That was the very first overdub. And then listen to the one I did about five years ago. That's a re kind of a reboot of that. Uh, and that was, those are only about three years apart. So um, I like to think of it as ready, fire, aim, you know, like just um, get in there and be, be com you know, be okay with it being not great at first and just uh, play around with different things. I did a lot of reading. I did a lot of, you know, YouTube tutorials and all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, I would say don't, you know, like, like the phrase I used earlier, you know, perfect is the enemy of great. Um, and I think that um, if you keep those three layers I talked about sort of in balance, you know, uh, you know, get some takes down and see what happens and listen back, write down. I like to write things down, you know, I mean, put it, you can put it in a digital note or anything. There's just something about the act of writing things down that commits it to a different part of your memory so that when you're working on that stuff, um, you're always uh, moving incrementally forward. You know, um, I have a, a philosophy that I that I try to teach my students and I wish I had known when I was a student is like this idea of that you're balancing mouse vision and eagle vision. I know that sounds kind of funny, but like a mouse can only see so far in front of itself. You know, it's in the grass or whatever. And, you know, that's what you should be doing most of the time is just working on making little things better at, a little bit at a time. And then every once in a while, go into eagle vision and say, okay, where am I headed? Where, where, what's, what career path do I want? What, what's, a, what's my ultimate goal? And then go back into, into mouse vision. That's, that applies for this recording stuff. Like it's, I, it's not fun at first, you know, like it can be a little frustrating to just kind of get over the hump. But I would encourage you all to record music that you enjoy playing first so that you get a feel for it that way when you turn to do the stuff that you have to do for competitions or whatever you you've kind of got this momentum of like um having fun with it and doing really good stuff you know um that'd be my in a nutshell that'd be my recommendation so uh i'd say listen 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 and in between your listening, you can make your incremental changes. But the the way I learned to do what I do was it's it really is kind of trial and error. Although we hope not always error, but it's you take these mics, you record something, you move them apart a little bit, record, listen again, and and have a consistent way of listening whatever it's on, you know, some old pair of headphones, if you know them and you know what you like on them, fine. Um, but just keep experimenting and uh, you'll see when things get better and when they get worse and you get used, used to that continuum and then it helps you to know when to stop messing around, you know. Uh, but it, it all comes down to, to doing it and, and just listening critically to what you have. Thank you so much for your time and for sharing your expertise with us. Um, if people have other questions um, and you wanna funnel them to me, um, that's fine and I'll see if I can get more answers for you. Um, but thank you all for coming and thank you for being here and um, hope you have a great night and Zoom round of applause for Larry and Jim. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Good night. <laughs>